Hey, watch Sarah Silverman, Someone You Love, on Max. Guys, did you know that in the last year, rates of anxiety and depression have doubled in the U.S.? Doesn't surprise me. These days, it can take months to get a traditional therapy appointment. And to add insult to injury, traditional therapy visits are on average over $100 per session. That can add up to thousands of dollars a year. Well, the good news is that Cerebral is 100% online mental health service that offers therapy and medication management for anxiety, depression, insomnia, stress, burnout, and more for one-third the price of traditional therapy. And treatment options are available with or without insurance. A Cerebral is here for anyone who's looking for Help with their mental health, which should be everyone, no matter where you are in your journey. Cerebral helps people with anxiety, depression, stress, insomnia, everything. If you feel like you're experiencing burnout or processing a major life event, Cerebral is care that is ready for you. Our listeners will receive an exclusive 50% off your first month of therapy by going to Cerebral.com slash Sarah. That's Cerebral.com slash Sarah for 50% off your first month of therapy. For quality mental health care that's accessible and affordable, join Cerebral today. Hi, everybody. It's your old pal, Sarah Silverman. And uh, I, um, my sister Susie, Rabbi Susie, has a good friend who forwarded her a video of her son Benji coming home from the dentist and he is like hi from the dentist one of those videos but he name checks me and it's pretty exciting so um let's can we show it it is a day like let's see like where are they gonna go it just doesn't make sense like I, I, I was thinking about this in the shower this morning actually and there's just there's no one I don't know what do you think yeah, I totally agree with you. It's the only way. Yeah. I like Sarah Silverman. She's hot. In like the best possible way. In like every possible way. Love Sarah Silverman. And I just watched her comedy special on Netflix. She was talking about like when I don't even know. I don't even know what she's talking about. She's so funny. She's so funny. Oh, she talks about her dad. And she she's like she didn't like sleep boy camp. But I, I like I like six points. Six points is fun. Six points. Go to six points. Danny Hurt, that's for you. I'm plugging six points. In the village, the peaceful village, the lion sleeps. I love at the end, he talks about six flags, and then he's literally, and then he's like, hey, I'm plugging six flags over here. <laughs> oh, Benji, thank you for that. Absolute joy. I don't know what special he was watching. It wasn't this latest one. Because I think um, she sent this to me before that came out. Must have been one of my uh, previous specials. And of course, it's sweet that I'm uh, talking about my dad. All right, let's take some voicemails. You left me a message. Now I'm playing it for the world. Let's hear some voicemails. Hi, Sarah. This is Sarah from New York. Uh, I called you once when I was pregnant (laughs) about two years ago, and I asked you what the reason was for your last cry. Now I'm calling because I'm wondering, um, I've noticed that you have a very healthy relationship with death and with grief. And I'm just wondering how you got there and um, if you can speak on that a little bit. Give us some insight. Thank you so much. I love you. 
Goodbye. Thank you. I look, yeah, you may notice that I have a healthy relationship with with death and grief. Um, but I will remind you that you see me for a little less than an hour a week. <laughs> and I'm pretty much um my best self during those times, these times. But yeah, I've had a a, a lot of people unfortunately die in my life. Close, close, close people. And, um, you know, and with my parents dying last month, um, that, that last three weeks with them was just, um, I was consumed with sadness, just con- my entire being. And of course, whilst all of that is going on, I'm also and all three of my sisters, all of us, all hands on deck are just doing nonstop work. You don't think about all the logistics that come with a loved one dying, you know, um, dealing with the hospital, dealing with hospice workers, payments, what's covered by this and what's not and what in mortuary and the, the mortuary and the reaching out to their friends the best we could, which we whiffed in a lot of ways, um, organizing care, learning to do the care, you know, thank goodness, you know, there's four girls, there's all of us sisters were there and two nieces and a nephew, all adults. And we were just all hands on deck. And still it was an overwhelming amount of work, um, while being just in an intense level of um, of, of grief, sadness, grief, pre-grief, grief. But boy, we were able to have some real quality time with them, especially with dad. <sighs> um, and we were lucky in that we were able to get closure with them, you know. But I, I just cling to the fact that they shed their sick, ailing, no longer functioning skin suits and are now free. And I hope, um, I know that they are out of pain and we're, we're the ones that hurt. We're the ones hurting and I, which I take comfort in, you know, I can handle my own pain. (laughs) Um, seeing them in pain was, was brutal especially Janice and, and knowing that they are no longer struggling, that, that, um, makes me feel immense relief, but it's, you know, it's rough. My shrink said something really great last, last week. He, he, cause we're going to go, um, do a picnic at their grave site, you know, and, um, and, uh, this weekend and, and, but he, and, and my shrink said, and he was quoting someone else, I think, but he's like, when you go visit your loved one at the cemetery, just know they are in the car with you on the way there and they leave with you when you, you know, on the way back home. And um, the grave site is just where their, their bones are, but they're with you, you know? So if it means something to you, and it does, it will mean something to us. It's something we're doing for ourselves to feel connected with them. But I mean, I think kind of everything we do, it's like, uh, you know, oh, that was Janice or that was dad doing that. Or, you know, and we can assign these meaningful things, which I think is religion kind of at its core. It's like assigning meaning to, to everyday things, you know, and that that's kind of the nice part of religion. If, if, should you be religious, which I'm not, but this feels religious anyway. Um, that's that's all I got for you. I I don't know if I that was helpful at all, but uh yeah, it's I'm just a person and but I'm I'm trying to figure it out and and that one thing is has always helped me with death is that they are not suffering. I'm we're suffering and that I can handle. Here's some ads. Chime baby, good money habits start with your very first paycheck and if you've just scored your first job, you've got an opportunity to jumpstart a healthy financial journey. When you sign up for Chime and link a qualifying direct deposit, you get access to benefits like getting paid up to 2 days early and fee-free overdraft up to 200 bucks. And with Chime, there are no monthly fees, no minimum balance, 
No deposit required to become a member. So sign up for Chime checking account today to link your paycheck. It only takes two minutes and doesn't affect your credit score. Get started at Chime.com slash Sarah. That's Chime.com slash Sarah. Chime is a financial technology company, not a bank. Banking services and debit card provided by the Bank Corp Bank N.A. or Stride Bank N.A. Members FDIC early access to direct deposit funds depends on payer spot me eligibility requirements and overdraft limit supply. See chime.com slash spot me. Ah, tickle, darling. Ah, tickle. It's time to go outside. I'm right in the middle of um really nesting in our outdoor areas, especially our patio. And boy, I love article. We'll look no further because Article's curated catalog of outdoor furniture is here to help you do all your favorite things this summer. I love Article. I've got my living room chairs from Article. I have my guest room bed frame from Article, which is gorgeous. And now uh, we're looking at some outdoor furniture. Article believes that every home can have a beautiful and delightful design that's curated just for you. And thanks to their online only model, they have some really delightful prices too. They have a curated assortment of mid-century modern, coastal, industrial, Scandi, and boho designs that make furniture shopping interesting and simple. Article's offering our listeners $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. To claim, visit article.com slash Sarah, and the discount will be automatically applied at checkout. That's article.com slash Sarah for $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. And we're back. Hey, Sarah. Um, I am 24 years old, and I have been self-harming since I was 13. Um more specifically cutting i'm hoping that people who would be triggered by that click out when they hear me say self-harm um sweetie i can't stop and um i feel like a child like i have a child problem and i don't know how to grow the fuck up and stop and treat myself with love the way i treat everybody else um yes have you ever struggled with this? Do you know anyone who's struggled with this? Is it all okay? <laughs> oh my God. I just want to hug you. Yeah, it's all okay. I I don't know about this stuff really, but um, it's interesting you said I feel like a child, like there's a child problem. And you know what? One, it's not. But two... It is. I think all our problems <laughs> are child's problems. And and the way we can deal with them is by being our own, parenting ourselves, by parenting ourselves. I, I, again, I don't know a lot about this, but I've, I've read a little bit about it. And I know that the, the, the most common human condition is feeling that we are not enough. And I think cutting and stuff like that stems from that. And the good news is you're not alone in feeling that way. That is the human condition. And we are enough, <laughs> even and especially you. I, I think cutting is, uh, I think, like a release valve um, for stress and anxiety, for distress and I think there are groups for this. I know there are, which I think, <laughs> again, is always a great, great way to work on stuff like this. To be in a group with other people that know exactly what you're going through and are in different stages of getting well and helping each other and, and, um, and understanding each other and really being able to help each other is going to be, as far as I know, your best bet. And I hope you do that. And you can do it by Zoom. I'm pretty positive. I mean, I, I, this is where I would go. I would search and then I would give you commas to say in between words. <laughs> I've recently learned that commas are not read by uh, our computers. <laughs> um, but, but 
to be in a group for cutting where you are with people in different phases of recovery, I think would be a really, really smart, helpful move for you. So number one, I would I would get into a group therapy situation for cutters, for self-harm. And I, I, I've i read that there are ways to try to trick the mind, and that's so much of what we do to cope, to trick the mind away from stuff like cutting, like, and, and these are probably, you know, I, this may not be helpful, but because they're simple, kind of a change of, um, like, get going outside or running, you know, um, exercise. When I feel extreme anxiety or rage, boy, I love to just run and run. I'm lying. I'm a power walker. I don't run. But sometimes I run. <laughs> um, like I live near a hill and boy, I've just been really ragey and frustrated and just gone and just run as fast as I can up that hill until I can't anymore. And it just, boy, it helps. Or a hot bath was a, a, a suggestion. I don't know that that is the cure for you, but, but um, I do remember seeing that. My instinct is that maybe you've got some like shame around um, your depression or your sadness, your hurt and and our instinct when we are hurt is to make someone else feel that hurt. And I think with people who self-harm, you're your own someone else, you know? Would you say that's true? I don't know. This is potentially a very ignorant theory. I'm not sure. But, but you're inflicting pain in order to feel in control. I, I do believe that, that self-harm, that cutting is a... Um, is a symptom of when you feel a lack of control in your life. So, you know, when you're having feelings of no control, yeah, I get, and I understand that. I think a lot of people understand and have different coping mechanisms for feeling a lack of control over their lives. And, and this one has taken hold with you. And boy, the feeling of having no control is so scary. And I wonder if making friends with that is something to try instead of fearing it. You know, try to be on the edge of your seat about it, about not knowing what's next in this life. You know, I eat it. it's so funny because we hate that life is a roller coaster and yet we pay money to ride roller coasters. <laughs> you know, like there's a real love hate vibe um, of this feeling that we have no control. So, Maybe try to make friends with that, with that feeling. Try to see the fear as, uh, kind of shift the fear into exhilaration. I mean, I'm talking out of my ass as always, but I think there might be something to that because it, it is what is. But more than that, whilst you are open to advice, ask someone who knows, join a therapy group um, for self-harm. Will you do that? I'd be so happy if you did that. And you sound so wonderful. And, and maybe check back in and, and let us know how, how you're doing in a, in a few months or six months or a year. I'd love to hear back from you. You know, listen, I only just heard your, your beautiful, vulnerable, brave, honest voice. And I love you. So good luck. And you know what? We'll, we'll post a a helpline or anything we can find that might help you or anyone else. Let's do that. Here it is. I'm pointing to it. Am I? I don't know. Okay. What else? Hello. I have a personal question. You seem a very friendly, very nice person, a person who can deal with any kind of people. And I'd like to know about you. Uh, that is there any situation when you feel when you don't feel friendly at all? Yes, yes. I mean, listen. I have um, I have my moments certainly, but I I am a, I am a people person in general. I love being alone, but when I'm out, I'm usually I'm interested in people. I like talking to strangers and stuff. I mean, it's a little different the dynamic because some people know who I am or they, you know, and then it, it changes the chemistry a little. And, and sometimes that's wonderful. And sometimes it's a bummer, but 
um, in terms of being unfriendly to people. Not usually, but yes, sometimes I am. Sometimes my gut says, do not be open with this person and just keep it going and moving right along. And it has served me well. And I think that's okay. I'm fine with it. <laughs> what else? Hi, Sarah. This is blank. Um, Did you say for blank? decades, men have been yelled at for peeing on the seat, but I'm not sure if you've noticed, but women pee under the seat. So if you lift up the seat, you'll notice on the underside that there's drips on there. That's and, still your pee. You know, I clean it off often. Um, now it makes me think that those seats that are horseshoe that are missing the front portion was not only for giving men, you know, room for their balls. Oh. Wait. But maybe it's also to prevent women from peeing under the seat. So maybe we missed that. Hmm. First of all, I think he said his name was blank. Or maybe he said it was Frank. <laughs> That's like my friend Carrie's dad was like, she's like, Dad, I'm going outside. And he was like, Blout side. What's that? Why? I don't know what to say. First of all, I, I never thought about this. There is the horseshoe kind of toilet seat, and then there's the all the way around kind. The horseshoe is for what? Is for men's balls? Where does that, where do the balls go? That, that, that little lip, uh, that little open area. What? Where are your balls? Uh, guys, uh, do you, uh, Roger, are you, uh, you have anything here? Is there? I, I, d I don't know. I've, you know, this is the first I've heard of this theory, A, that women pee under seats. I've, I've never heard it. I think that's I guys pee. Don't think I've seen evidence of it personally, but I, I don't know. And the horseshoe thing, I, I, that's a pretty, that's a high minority of toilet seats. I'm talking maybe 10% of toilet seats are horseshoe, I think. So I don't think it's a popular toilet seat. But toilet seat <laughs> covers look like the horseshoe. Yeah, I know. But I put, I put them the other way. That's true. This they do. They are like a horseshoe. That's true. Yeah, you rip out that thing. Um, I, I I guess I found this guy amusing. I'm not sure his theories make a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I mean, don't know like, where what he's talking about with the balls. I one. <laughs> why does a horseshoe <laughs> toilet seat make room for your balls? I I'd love to know that. I'd love to know how a woman peeing out of her vagina into a bowl would touch the rim of said bowl. But, you know, I mean, listen, sometimes if I push really hard, it does, it kind of, there's a mist. There's like a sea breeze. <laughs> now you're admitting to, you're copping to it. But I don't, I mean, not real. I mean, I don't know, but, um, Hold on, I had a never, and, oh, I will say, and, and Roy's not going to like this, and he said, if you're going to talk about me, at least run it by me first, but I'm just going to say this. When I get up in the morning to pee, there are like one to three drops on the floor, and I said, Rory, if you pee in the middle of the night, just sit down and pee, and he said, I will never, I will never do that, and I was just like, that's some, I feel like that's some toxic masculinity talking, like, why are you, why is there shame around sitting down to pee if you're a man? Like, I guess that's a thing. Like, good, but that guy fucking sits down to pee. <laughs> but I, I see no shame in it. I mean, just like you're just, you don't have to be a hero. This isn't target practice. Anyway, there you go. What else? Hey, best friend, Sarah. So I'll try to make it succinct. I made a friend about six years ago and spent a lot of time together, a girl best friend. And uh, after, I don't know, a couple of years, I don't know, shit started to look weird with her. Turns out she's a complete fraud and total piece of shit. I had no idea. I thought she was great. So, number one, I feel really stupid because there I had a few friends that sort of questioned my helping her, I suppose. They're like, well, you know, this sounds a little weird and blah, 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 blah. So that's why I'm calling you. Um, but really what I want to know is, number one, has something like this ever happened to you? Is he calling because from inside imagine, a birdcage? You know, you're like a famous and um, rich person, so people are trying to fraud you, I would imagine, sometimes. I'm, you know, 
comfortable. I'm not wealthy or anything. And this is not, I mean, I'm out a little bit, but it's, it was more about my time and, you know, that kind of thing. Secondly, how do you vet people into your life? Well, I'm sorry that that happened to you. Um, it sounds like you had some good times with her. Maybe it was worth it. Maybe you got a high quality lesson out of it. Uh, yeah, I got bamboozled a couple of times when I first lived in New York City and then once out here from someone in my apartment building. But for the most part, I've, I've, I have a pretty good, I've, I think maybe from those things, actually, I have grown a pretty good bullshit detector and I've learned to trust my gut um, completely. And that's how I navigate that stuff. I don't have much more else to say, but, um, you know, that use this as a valuable lesson. Go back and think about what those red flags were uh, so that next time you might um, trust your gut a little bit more. Here's some ads. ZocDoc, baby. You know, even out here in L.A. with all their fancy doctors, it's hard to get an appointment. And then you get an appointment and they act like they're not focused on you. I'm not kidding. I have a doctor where when I go in, I'm like, hey, 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 over here. Focus on me. You know, you can see them thinking of the last person they saw, the next person they're going to see. Well, the good news is that at ZocDoc, you will find quality doctors who focus on you, listen to you, and prioritize your care. ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient-reviewed, take your insurance, are available when you need them, and treat almost every condition under the sun. When you're not feeling your best, finding great care shouldn't take up all your energy. That's where ZocDoc comes in. Using their free app that millions of users rely on, you can find the right doctor that meets your needs and fits your schedule. Book an appointment with a few taps of their app and start feeling Feeling better faster with ZocDoc. ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient reviewed, take your insurance, and are available when you need them and treat almost every condition under the sun. Go to ZocDoc.com slash Silverman and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash Silverman. ZocDoc.com slash Silverman. Oh, Sundays for Dogs, baby. Wow. Sundays for Dogs has taken over our lives. Um, this stuff is so good. It is air-dried dog food made from a short, a very short list of human-grade ingredients. We have a, a, a 12 pound dog and an 80 pound dog, and they both eat the same food. This Sunday for dogs is both a high quality treat and something we put in their food, and it can be solely their food. We like, we like to mix it up. Sundays contains 90% meat, 10% vegetables, and 0% synthetic nutrients. Let me tell you, they love this food. Unlike other fresh dog food, Sundays is zero prep, zero mess, zero stress. It honestly feels too easy to feed them. Every order ships right to your door, so you'll never worry about running out of dog food again. Sundays costs 40% less than other healthy dog food brands because Sundays doesn't waste money shipping frozen packages. Instead, they spend on what matters, sourcing the best all-natural ingredients for your pup. We worked out a special deal for our dog-loving listeners. So get 35% off your first order of Sundays. Go to sundaysfordogs.com slash Sarah or use code Sarah at checkout. That's S-U-N-D-A-Y-S-F-O-R-D-O-G-S dot com forward slash Sarah. Upgrade your pup to Sundays and feel good about the food you feed your dog. And we're back. Hi, Sarah. I just wanted to catch up with you about when it's important to be honest with people about issues that are deeply private. I have two health issues, um, one of which is not as serious as the other, but they both create some distance around me and other people. The first health issue is a mental illness, and it's one of the dramatic ones. Um, I take very good care of myself and 
Um, you know, can't have it completely under control, but um, I'm in pretty good shape. So, but I have been shunned when I have told people this, or they have used it as an excuse when we have a disagreement. It's no, not the not facts nice. or the circumstances, it's the fact of my illness that has caused a disagreement. So, when I meet new people, it takes me a while to tell them. And then sometimes it feels like, oh my God, I haven't told them in all this time. And now I'm going to hurt their feelings when I reveal this big secret. So that's one illness. And then the other is I have herpes and it's just killed my sex life. And, um, and I'm overwhelmed. I've done tons of research. There's no perfect way of protecting somebody, but it's, you know, it's created this barrier and I, I really like some help about how to discuss that. So anyway, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you. Listen, everyone has things. Everyone, every single person has things. I don't know what your mental health issue is. You said it was pretty heavy. You know, I'm just, I'm, my brain's going to schizophrenia or bipolar, both of which can be managed with um, medication. You do not have to share that with anyone if you don't feel comfortable sharing it with anyone. I mean, I, I it's a piece of you. It's a, a part of what makes you a, a beautiful, unique human being and a part of humanity. Um, and I would say if you're in a relationship with someone, that's they should that they should know. But it shouldn't matter. And with the right person, it won't matter. I always say like those kinds of things, if they drive people away, good. It's a good screening system for people who are not going to be there for the long haul. As for herpes, I think one in four people have it. Um, isn't that right, Raj? Let's see. There's four of us here. Me, Travis, Raj. I, I, I'm just from a quick Google. It says that one in four women have herpes and one in eight men do. One in four women have herpes and one in eight men do? Yeah, it kind of seems. That makes me so angry because I guarantee you most of those women got it from men. <laughs> Maybe not, but I'm going to guess they did. Anyway, a substantial amount of the population has it. And it, if you're careful, it doesn't have to be an issue. I, I just know because I had a boyfriend in my 20s who had oral herpes. And he could always tell. And by the way, he got it from his first kiss when he was 15. <laughs> um, which is so heartbreaking and adorable. But um, he always could tell. He had a sensation if one would, before it even became visible at all. He could feel it like a, a tingle and he would steer clear of me. He was very responsible. It wasn't something I had to remember or he would, even if I forgot and went to kiss him, he would stop me. He was very, very, very conscious of it. And he, we were together for a few years he, and he, it, he never gave it to me. Um, and I felt really safe because he was so conscious of it and so, um, this doesn't feel like the right word, anal about it. But um, it, does, it doesn't have to be um, a thing. And again, it's a great screening system, you know? <laughs> like, the person who stays with you is going to love you. And you're lovable and worthy of love. And you are most certainly not the only person with bipolar or schizophrenia or, or depression or whatever mental health issue, big mental health issue that you said you had, um, and herpes. You're not the only one with both of those things, not by a long shot. Know that. Know that. Okay. What else? Hey, Sarah, how are you? I just saw your show. It was awesome. And I got to meet you backstage. And while I want to remain anonymous, I will say we were the group that you had that exchange about the green flannel shirt. Um, so I just wore it yesterday. It was a blast and we loved it. <laughs> anyway, I am calling with a bit of a dilemma. Um, we have a friend in our circle of friends 
who's a wonderful, devoted, compassionate, hilarious, life of the party friend. Who's wonderful. Especially been there for my partner through some of her darkest days, but she is extremely hard on people in romantic relationships. And in our community, people sort of date around, they date each other, they break up and they'll date someone else in the, in our friend group. Totally. So we do know some of her exes who have categorized these relationships as a bit emotionally abusive and people can't figure out why we're still friends with this person, but she's a lovely friend. And it's such a dilemma to me. And I don't, I don't quite know what to do about it or if I should, um, be friends with this person still who I love, or if I should honor the experience of our other friends and not be friends with this person. So I wonder what you think about that. Thanks. Ah, uh, of course I remember you, by the way. I wore that green plaid shirt yesterday. I can't get it to look as good on me as it was on your friend. But, uh, ooh, I love it. It's so soft. Anyway, um, Listen, I think it is okay to stay friends with someone who's a great friend and who is shitty in relationship. I have many, many comedian friends who I love with my entire heart that I would not fix up with <laughs> someone I cared about in a million years because they cheat and they're shitty in relationship. They're not good in romantic relationship. You know, we're living in this time where everyone must be wonderful in all aspects of life to warrant love. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's if this is right or wrong advice, but this is how I do it. You know, um, now I, I don't know which friend is closer or if, uh, you know, this is going to be a, a problem with your friends that are exes with your this person so uh, you may have to do like a pros versus cons list but yeah I get it the lesbian community is just like the stand-up community and they of course in the Venn di diagram of both overlap because there are many lesbian comedians and I know it is a totally incestuous community you know that's like you know I, I lost my virginity to a comedian and slept with comedians. Comedians were my pool of boyfriends and they all still exist in my world because we're comics. We see each other on the road all the time. It's the same. It's very similar. Um, so I get that the, you, you, we, you are in that same pool, you know, but uh, it's, a, it's a pool of people you're going to date within and it's a pool of people that are going to be your friends forever and there's always going to be that stuff. So uh, good luck. I, I Listen, I, I have friends that aren't perfect. Can you imagine? Can you even believe it? I have friends that have not figured out a healthy relationship. I have friends that are shitty in other aspects of life. And I still love them. Can you imagine? And good luck. And I really loved meeting you, by the way. I remember it was like they were like, oh, there are some like, people from the board of the theater that you have to meet. And I was like, oh, like in my mind, I had such a different vision. And then I met you guys and I was like, oh, we would be friends. Like, I, I know you. Like, you know, we're, we're the same kind of ilk. So that I had a real nice time meeting you guys. Y'all. All right, what else? Hi, Sarah. Um, I, uh, was, I had a question on um, what your take is on leading a sort of self-destructive lifestyle that a lot of young people and even older people, you know, kind of get stuck in as far as drugs and alcohol. Um, I um, recently had an altercation with officers while I was blacked out on rum, and I thought I had a better idea of how to handle it from seeing my own father, who was an alcoholic, and dozens of other native americans on the reservation i grew up on so seeing all that it made me feel like i can go into it you know and sort of like have better control of myself but after seeing this i can see that i'm still kind of growing up and you know the first thing i did when i got home was i grew my shot glasses the way i'm 
done with shots and I guess I'm just kind of wondering like if you've ever had a type of like point in your life where you know the things you did were self-destructive how did you sort of overcome it and you know if you ever had problems with the law like I don't know it's just I don't know I guess my basic question is how do you think I can improve myself from being self-destructive I guess you know to sum it up I think this is huge. You know, just just seeing the pattern is huge. This is the stuff. There are people that don't even see that, you know. Now you have to break the pattern. And uh, boy, I, you know, the AA is a great way to do it. Why? Because it's just um you have support. You have you're you're with a room of people going through the same thing. At various stages of it, the people farther ahead of you are going to be your support system. The people newer than you, you're going to be a support system for. And all of it just helps stay sober. So I'm glad you threw away your shot glasses. If you're really looking to be sober, you got to throw it all away. And um, find other ways to get relief. You know, I'm, it's above my pay grade to talk about the systemic, you know, um, abuses and traumas for an entire people that has led to a lot of alcoholism within, you know, is, is a thing. And it's a thing that I, I'm, I don't know enough to talk about, but to just kind of reference and say, I, I know there's a whole other layer to it you know that is uh, cu cultural and put upon you culturally and uh, and I'm just proud of you for seeing a pattern that you don't want for yourself and 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 making a change but it sounds like you're really uh, you're really on the right track that's all I've got. I'm sorry. Your question was smarter and more insightful than my answer. Truly. Call me. Let me know how it's going. All right. Good luck. Hey, Sarah. It's Jammin calling from up the road in North Hollywood, California. I love the podcast. I've been a fan of yours since the T-Mobile sidekick commercials. There's a flashback for you. What? I've been listening to many episodes and I have to say, you sound like a bit of a therapist. And I think this podcast is such an incredible gift you're giving your fans. And it got me thinking, what would Sarah Silverman have done with her life if she wasn't a successful comedian slash public figure slash actress? And I Googled it and I couldn't find anything. So did you have any sort of backup plan if things hadn't worked out in the entertainment industry? Like, what do you think you would have done? Um, I thought maybe something in the mental health field, but I thought I'd go straight to the source. So just wanted to know. Love ya. All the best. Hey, no ho. Um, I never had a backup plan. Yeah. I, I mean, I, my dad talked to me, you know, got me to drop out of college. So I really had no backup plan, but I'm glad. I mean, I, he did the right thing. It's funny. Cause then I would like play colleges as a comic and, and do gigs there. And I, around that age, and I was like, Oh, I would have loved this you know, grassy campus and all that experience. But, um, but this was the path that I'm on. But I, yeah, I never had a, a backup plan, but I have mused about what I would do if I wasn't a, co a comedian or a writer or an actor or anything at all, show busy shit. Um, I would definitely, I think I would be maybe a teacher. I'd probably be a teacher like junior high school or high school, or I would maybe work with mentally challenged adults. All right. Well, dad. This is the, the time of the show where I say subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like watching with your eyeballs, uh, you can watch us on YouTube. All right? All right. See you next time. Subscribe here so you don't miss an episode. And you can click here to watch the last episode if you missed it.